Yes, sir. SSC, ready to roll. SSC, with fast chase rolling, you are clear supersonic. Clear supersonic, SSC is rolling. Two good nozzles looking for max. Three fifty. Four fifty. Jesus. Get the foot down. Five fifty. Got to hit those birds. Seven hundred. Just about in control on the wrong line, don't worry about it. 7.30, it's going to be a goodie. The Kipper Express flickering. It's going to be under a measured mile. The turners are still good. Excellent. 50 feet offline, 600 slowing down. I would say that was fast. 450, shoot one. Yes, we got it. Everything is going to be wonderful. Bye. It was a fantastic thrill back in 1997 to be part of Richard Noble's Thrust SSC team and to run the world's first supersonic car. Not just go through the sand barrier once or indeed twice to set the, the world record because you've got to do it two ways within one hour to set an official record. We actually broke the, uh, the speed of sound officially on five separate occasions, setting the new and still only supersonic world land speed record. The psychology of trying to build the world's first supersonic car was massively difficult, and we had to convince ourselves and a lot of other people it was even possible at all. There was so much we didn't know. If you think back 18 years, Broadband internet didn't exist. One household in five in the UK had a computer and had internet access. It was really the dark ages in IT terms. We got a huge amount of information from that, but we still had to go out and test it step by step and prove that we could control those massive forces to keep the car on the ground, to make sure that we didn't crush it by having it a fraction of a degree nose down or generate 10 tonnes of lift, hurl it into the air and destroy it by having it a fraction of a degree nose up, either of which would spoil my day as the driver. So in some ways, breaking a thousand miles an hour is easier. But let's not underestimate the sheer size of a thousand miles an hour as a land speed record. World land speed record is different from everything else. In conventional motor racing, of course, the whole idea about conventional motor racing is to get the best possible race. Okay, and the last thing we want in a conventional motor race is somebody right out the front and everybody else sort of miles behind. Um, what you want is a very close race. So in order to get a very close race, it's very important all the cars are very, very similar. Similar in size, similar in shape, similar in power output, similar um, weight drivers, all the rest of it. The rules state that the car must have four or more wheels and it must be controlled by the driver and that's all. So all the other cars are completely different. Therefore our technology won't transfer to anybody else's. And the other people will think, well, the Bloodhound people, you know, they haven't really got that right, have they? You know, not sure how it's going to work. So they're, uh, they'll have completely different ideas. So it's great, the technology doesn't, doesn't transfer. If the tra technology doesn't transfer, then you make everything available. That's what we're doing on a huge, huge scale. It goes um, 0 to 1,000 miles an hour back to 0 again in around about 85, 90 seconds. So in a minute and a half it does 10 miles. The measured mile is something about 3.5 seconds. Um, it travels 4.5 football pitches a second. And, and it's hard to put those in perspective, but your blink reflex is a fifth of a second. You could sit in a football stadium and as you blinked and opened your eyes again, the car would have come in one side, gone out the other side. 47,000 pounds of thrust. Um, that's about 20 tonnes, so that's quite a lot of thrust. 
Um, as far as horsepower, it depends on speed, but approximately it's about 133,000 brake horsepower. One of the biggest challenges we've got is literally the 60 minutes. Um, historically, 60 minutes was set when it was pretty easy to do a turnaround. Uh, you know, you'd go through the measured mile, you get to the end, you'd top up with a bit of fuel, kick the tyres, have a fag, and then drive back in the other direction, no problem. For us, our car's extremely complicated. We've got a hell of a lot going on. The fact that we have to change the rocket at the end of the run makes it very difficult. So we're removing a four metre long, 18 inch diameter uh, rocket which has just been burning away at extreme temperatures and we've got to take that out and replace it within a very very short time period. The, the rocket used to be above the jet, originally the rocket was a little bit smaller and as the cars progressed the rockets got a bit bigger um, but the, the problem was that again that the safety issue if with the rocket on the top of the car it was trying to bury the nose as you turn the rocket on as you turn the rocket off, it was a big pitch change in the car. So it went from nose down to nose up. You had to have the winglets, the little, the little fins on the front of the car, and the back of the car working really well to keep it balanced. So it was much, much more stable. And also meant we could make a much stronger car. They stick out further now. We yeah. went for a narrow wheel track to try and reduce some of the drag. My dad was a design engineer, um, and so he was always in the garage mucking around with stuff, so I would just used to follow him around and do stuff like that. Um, so I've always made, built, played around with bits and pieces. So I had that inspiration, if you like, firsthand. Um, some kids aren't lucky enough to do that, and I think in a society where we throw stuff away, we don't repair, we don't take things apart. Um, it's really difficult for kids to, to get that experience. Um, design technology, when I first started teaching it, um, suddenly became a paper exercise. So kids didn't make stuff as well in schools. So they've lost that connection with how things are made and materials and what have you. So I think a project like this, really trying to inspire them to do that um, is, is really necessary. Back in Thrust SSC days, the internet was in a very embryonic state and they did an amazing job of putting the story out there. Um, it was flagged up quite regularly. The press found Thrust SSC too technical for them, so largely ignored it until they did the final attempt. Whereas we've very much made the mantra for Bloodhound to make the technology accessible. So it's an engineering adventure and we take people along on the ride. So we introduce and explain the technology in we don't dumb down, but we make it accessible for people to engage with it and understand. And then you can tell the story and say, this is why it's exciting, this is why a jet engine is exciting technology, this is why a rocket is exciting technology. I once had a conversation with somebody who worked on Thrust SSC, um, and I asked him what it was like to work on that project, and he came back with the retort, he didn't see his children grow up, he got divorced because of the project. He worked 90 hours a week and he's never found a job since that's compared to the job of working on Thrust SSC. Uh, and I asked him the question, would he do it again? And his answer was yes. Um, I don't have any fears about what's gonna happen after we finish this project. This project will open up so many doors. Um, it's just which one you choose to walk through.
Uh, Thousand Miles an Hour is actually the secondary aim of this project. The first aim is to get young kids and people excited about engineering science and technology and maths and to make sure that we've got younger people going into engineering in the future because we've got a real shortage of engineers at the moment. And that really goes through the whole project from when we started. Um, it's, it's to really get something that's iconic, it's like the Concorde, it's like the Apollo, it's something that this generation can really, this generation of school kids can really get excited and enthused about. got 4,800 schools on it. That's about two million school kids. I mean, the thing is getting very big indeed. And now they're starting to, all the kids are starting to make rocket cars now. So all that sort of building up. Uh, it's fascinating uh, about what's happening. There's a huge, great movement here. If you find the technology exciting, um, learn more about it. Learn how a jet engine works, how the rocket works. Make your own model rocket cars, race them. What would I say to people? I would say, you know, get behind it, back it. You know, this is a, a British enterprise. We're, we're very good at doing this kind of stuff. Um, we're very good at being very inventive and the British public need to get behind it because it, it's theirs, it's their project. Yeah. There are 10,000 names on the fin of the car. Um, we've got room for 120,000 names. Let's fill it up. And the result of which is, long after we've gone and finished, uh, there will be an enormous number of engineers in Britain. And uh, that's going to be very satisfying, it really is. This is a genuine global adventure to get the biggest team in the world into it. www.bloodhoundssc.com is that team adventure. Join us, take part in the world's most exciting 1,000 mile an hour engineering adventure.